the stuff that Monero uses for uh, for uh, specifically for range proof with bulletproof is is newer. Something is not the same level of uh, of trust assumption. I mean the sign the signature in Monero is somehow even safer slightly of, on the margin than the right. one used in Bitcoin. But they are both very consolidated. What the the, the new cryptography used for uh, for amount checking especially for the range proof is something newer especially after the adoption of bulletproof which was great for size and speed but it's something super new and and invented by a bitcoiner so maybe it was it just wanted to to mess with you guys <laughs> <laughs> this week on monero talk is sponsored by monero.com wallet store send receive and exchange your monero safely on ios and android too Monero.com wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused audited and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Monero.com wallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in our yat free speech money into your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk, Douglas Tuman continues his conversation with Giacomo and Seth in part two of a thorough critique of Monero. Monero Talk starts now. One thing I want to clarify that I should have said earlier is that I think it's important to distinguish that Monero, the only piece of the privacy that is obfuscation and not encryption, which I think are, are that is a key difference, is the ring signature mechanism. So that, that membership proof is obfuscation, whereas the amount hiding and the address hiding are encryption in a, an easier sense. That's still semantic, but it's much more of a, it's actually being completely hidden there. The amount is completely non-visible. The addresses are completely unlinkable from uh, public addresses, but the ring signature is obfuscation. So I just wanted to clarify that one point. Yeah, yeah, Only right. one piece of the approach to Monero is what, just obfuscation. I yeah, I would say ring signature is obfuscation in a strict technical way. Mm -hmm. uh, while uh, while uh, confidential transactions uh, with, with uh, the range proofs is, uh, is encryption, but I will call it obfuscation in the sense that you are still putting all the information on the global ledger, but you are, in this case, cryptographically obfuscating it. So you 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 need, the, for example, if you if it was not obfuscated, you will not read, need the range proof. Uh, you will not need the, the 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 a lot of stuff. You could you could compress it more if it was clear text. So it is in a way increasing the information on the global ledger in order to hide it. Would you agree? But it's uh, no, because it's not. It's not obfuscation of the amount and the addresses because they're they're cryptographically encrypted. It's not something where we're just kind of hiding in the noise, like with yeah. ring signatures or something like that, where you're you're trying to make it too hard to guess what the correct thing is. Understand what you're saying. But, uh, yeah, you're saying that it's safer, so. basically. It's a straight safer guarantees. Yeah, it's not and that just it cannot it cannot be known. It's not be like it's just hoping. It is. It cannot be known, which is it's a much stronger technique for privacy than obfuscation. Sure, 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 sure. I was I was not hinting at an easy uh, decryptability of the yeah. amount. I was hinting at the fact that the information is still there, but you are putting more bits. In order to in order to hide it, in this case, to hide it in a very uh, secure way, not not just uh, confuse. I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify the language there. Sure. Um, and then one more thing about layer two, so we can move on. Uh, I I think it is important to mention that the privacy of the base layer is an important aspect of how useful layer two networks and literally layer in networks, if we want to just be more broad can be because when you have a strong private base layer, even if building a layer two network is more difficult, like you said, it, it is more difficult in Monero. Um, it's doable. I think there's basically three unique approaches right now that have been proposed. They're theoretical. They're not uh, things that have been done in practice, but they're, they're theoretical ways that you can do a payment channel lightning network like uh, layer two for Monero. But the beautiful thing is because of the base layer privacy of Monero, you gain a lot of privacy at upper layers and you solve a lot of the problems that we currently have with Lightning Network on Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin's base layer is transparent, you inherit that transparency into the layer two network. And so a lot of the core privacy issues with Lightning are because of that transparency. So while you do get that 
mo slightly more difficult layer two network approach and you do get the reduced scaling per let's just say per byte rather than transaction. Just, I don't, I don't really know a w better way to simplify that because comparing transactions between Bitcoin and Monero is, is not really yeah. apples to apples. Um, but when you're, you do get that worse scalability, but you gain all of these things and those things cascade up to upper layers as well. So even a, a layer two network like you would build on Monero would be in many ways more private and more usable and more fungible than a lightning network um, is as well, which I, I think is an unimportant aspect of that as well, that you're not just benefiting the base layer by implementing these strong privacy measures for every transaction, this fungibility for every transaction, but you also ensure that that carries up, or at least that a base layer of that carries up to any layers that are built on top, um, which is another big advantage and that it, it compounds the benefits that you get from that privacy. Okay. So this this is this is amazing. We're we're an hour in and we've only been through the first the uh, first point. <laughs> <laughs> so no, sorry, because it's a lot and, later there it, than it is here. Yeah, now it's it's <laughs> one a.m. But I mean, I have to I have to train for not sleeping because the second baby is coming out uh, in, in any day. So I have to train anyway. So I can <laughs> if you guys can stay, I can stay. Yeah. We're helping you. We're helping you prep. There we go. We will as long <laughs> as you're willing to. So the second point would be uh, about security. Um, and uh, this goes uh, directly against what Seth was just saying, that uh, if you do privacy on second layer and you have privacy on first layer, that will help, which is true. But uh, my point will be that having privacy at the first layer could be, I'm not saying it's it's a, a haram in general. I'm saying that it is problematic. It can be problematic for as a general principle, as a first principle for security in two ways. Many people are... Are, are, are commenting the trivial uh, way that probably you also mentioned on the FUD article. So if you have an inflation bug in Bitcoin, no, probably you don't. You, you just you just mentioned the FUD about uh, the total supply bit not non -audit, uh, auditable in general. But the, the point is usually if you have a, su a supply inflation bug in Bitcoin, you see that counting. And the solution is obvious. You don't have to have any kind of software engineering test, or it, you can just see the inflation counting, even even just looking on a on a chain explorer. While if you have the same on a Zcash shielded part or in Monero, you may have uh, economic disruption way more serious if uh, either the mathematics of it is broken or the software implementation is uh, is backed. The second point, which is less often discussed, and I will just lump it together so you can answer together, is security against double spending. So right now in Bitcoin, the theory goes, it's not really that, that done in practice, but the theory goes that when I receive a payment, I will wait for a number of confirmation because in theory, uh, the more my, my trans, the transaction uh, I received gets buried under many blocks, the exponentially harder it would, it's more expensive it would be to try to reorg it for the for the payee, uh, for the payer. Sorry. So uh, I wait more. If I receive a lot of money, I wait more. Of course, this first naive proxy is broken because you can do a wide and shallow attack in which you pay a little bit to many many people and then you you reorg all the stuff. So you think you received a, a small amount, but actually the the attacker is 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 a is, is benefit of a very large pool of double spendings. But a second proxy, which is stricter that you can use, is just you, you count the total amount of money moved in the blocks uh, with your transaction. That's a very conservative approach, a very paranoid approach, but it can give you a general metric of security. When you obfuscate the amounts on the base layer, you completely lose that. I, I'm not strictly, I, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion about that, probably the privacy is worth the security risk. But I don't see many people discussing the fact that when you don't have the amounts, understanding how many confirmations are safe, it's a very dif difficult calculation in general. I think it's a trade-off that should be recognized. And I understand if uh, some people may, be, uh, may consider it uh, so much strong that maybe they will want to give up the advantage that you were talking about. So keeping the first layer, the blockchain based layer, very clear about amounts uh, bo for both the inflation problems and security budget problems, and to try to make an extra effort to hide everything on second layers instead. 
Do you mind just explaining a little bit of what you mean by how knowing the amounts of transactions within blocks gives you a better picture of how secure your funds are? Because really yeah. all it comes down to is the the fees, not the actual amounts in the transactions, correct? How, how I don't, I'm not sure I, I see how the, uh, the actual amounts of transactions, because fee amounts are transparent in Monero. The amounts of the transactions themselves are not. So how does knowing the amounts of the transactions help you to get a better idea of how many confirmations you need to wait for? Yeah, basically the idea is that, uh, it, um, so in theory, if I get paid $100, I must know that the uh, that the, the the budget of the uh, attacker must be below one hundred dollars. Otherwise, it will not even attack. So, to make it um, game theoretically non-convenient to attack, the amount I receive, not the fee, but the actual payment amount that I think it could be uh, the, the double spent, must be more than the cost of the attack. So, I can estimate the maximum cost of the attack so that the depth of the reorg based on how much I receive. This is the naive approach. Since I cannot know if the same guy is trying to, to scam other people in the same block, the, the, the craziest assumption could be is that he will try to scam every, that somehow, of course, this, this is absurd, it's too much. But the crazy, the, the most conservative assumption is this guy is the author of all the transaction in this block and by reorging them, he can afford the budget, which is a, which is a compatible with the, Get, getting away with all these transactions. So not the fees, but the transaction amount itself. Yeah, that's a very interesting approach to modeling your own transaction security. I've, I've never heard that before. Um, so it's definitely something I'll have to dig into more. I mean, I think the the main thing to keep in mind is you can still see the amount of your transaction. So sure. like you said, that, that the naive one model is safe. Yeah. works the same in Monero as it does in Bitcoin. Um, and fee-based model, you can still do the same way. But... Yeah, you couldn't do that same type of how many other transactions and what are their amounts are happening. Um, to be fair, nobody does it in practice. Yeah. I'm just saying that you are giving up some security guarantee that maybe we take for, for, for granted in Bitcoin, but in some other historical period, maybe more adversarial could play different, very different roles in, in blockchain wars. And yeah. uh, And you see that as a larger security issue than the issue of not being able to, quote unquote, audit the supplies easily? No, just one which is less discussed, less often discussed, but it's probably smaller. But do, you, do you see, you know, uh, there being potential security advantages with privacy as well? Are there like if you, if you had to like go on the other side of the argument? What would you are there, are there any potential security advantages that you get with privacy on the on the protocol level? Well, I think that you don't have specifically inflation guarantee advantages. You can have less disadvantages. You can try to uh, to to fix the best. For example, even just in cryptography, you always have to choose between perfectly binding and hiding, and you can just try to fit the Goldilocks zone, but you will never get a security advantage when you have something which is more hiding you usually don't get anything more binding. Uh, you, you have It's a trade-off in general. You can probably uh, you can probably get a very good trade-off positioning, but I, 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 privacy like itself is security. So, I don't know, like Seth, maybe you can jump in on this too. Like, is there a scenario where stealth addresses potentially off, offers a security advantage? I mean, the biggest security advantage that you get from strong on-chain privacy is one against targeted censorship. That's really the the main security advantage that you get as the person transacting. Again, that's not, oh, well, uh, the recipient as well on both sides because it's not possible for a miner to selectively censor specific transactions because he knows that they're going to a political dissident or from a uh, political dissident or whatever. Whatever scenario you want to look at, you, you do gain immensely better security guarantees as those people transacting when you have privacy because that can't be easily detected on chain and then censored by compliant pools. I mean, that's a, a whole another topic of security, but there is that problem of the potential of compliant mining pools within Bitcoin sure. that enforce whitelists, blacklists, whatever. Um, well, and they're able to do the selective censorship that they couldn't do in Monero. So I think that is a key piece. It's different than a like a specific transaction not looking at what the transaction is but just is my hundred dollars going to come through that's a different 
type of security, but it is a very important one because censorship resistance is very much enabled by privacy at the base layer. Um, it can still exist without it. And Bitcoin so far has been censorship resistant at the protocol level. Um, but uh, that is a, a key thing that you gain with strong on-chain privacy. I'm still, I still disagree about this. I mean, I agree with the way you put it that it's the difference is, is, is making it z binary, zero or one, or I, th I don't think having it binary is an advantage. I think that in Monero, you can censor everything, of course, not selectively, yeah. but I don't think that, I don't think that the current state of the world, well, I I'm repeating myself, so I will just cut it short, but in general, I'm very skeptical about this argument that making it all or nothing will help. But anyway, I mean, agree to disagree on that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Seth, sorry. Oh, I was just going to jump back to the, the auditing topic, but do you have anything to... Yeah, I just want to make... Yeah, you can get into that. I just want to make one one general topic too, just and what I was trying to get at with my question is, when you say security, right, there, there's a lot of little things you could look at. Seth is bringing up another instance that may give Monero advantage. Uh, other other idea, you know, other thoughts too are, you know, the elliptic curve itself, right? Uh, Monero and Bitcoin use different elliptic curves. There's arguments that Bitcoin's uh, is not as secure as Monero's uh, cryptographers say. So you could assess some risk there for Monero, for Bitcoin security. Uh, so when you say the, the security of, of Monero, um, are you weighing it against all the potential, you know, disadvantages that that Bitcoin security may have? Another another one is, you know, we talk about um, the the mining network and how you know there, there's this risk with that without tail emission, there may not be a large enough incentive for miners to continue to mine. That plays into security, uh, you know, whether or not are are you are you weighing all of these things together when you say? you're concerned about Monero security more than, than Bitcoin. Are you taking all those things into account or are you just looking at like one aspect of it? No, no, you're completely right. I wasn't. I was specifically talking about uh, anti-double spending guarantees or anti-inflation guarantees. If, if, if I was talking about security in general, privacy itself is security. If somebody is more private, he would be more secure. If uh, somebody has a private information about you, you or are, you are, your families are less safe. So security in general, it's way more complex and multidimensional. Uh, since you, mens you mentioned tail emissions, tail tail emissions I, I think that I could try it. If Seth, you, you didn't have anything else to say about I want to touch on auditing a little bit, sure. but we can talk about tail emission first if you want. Oh, okay, very quick. Uh, this is one of the example I, I recently discussed again with Peter about that. Peter thought is, is your ally. He wants to bring television on Bitcoin. It, it would never happen, of course. But I think that uh, the way it works in Monero, it doesn't make a different a, a difference. It doesn't make a difference in the sense that critics are saying it does, because uh, it, because it because eventually the uh, the percentual inflation is going to zero anyway, asymptotically. So it doesn't change scarcity in a relevant way, but I don't even think that it changes the security of, um, of, um, of uh, long-term um, blockchain in, in a relevant way for two reasons. First, I don't think that, uh, that uh, inflation uh, issuance, that, that inflation subsidy really affects security where it matters. Again, I'm using this too broad term. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that, I, I think that the most, the most likely attack on the mining uh, game by nation state entities will be empty blocks or something which is economically identical to empty blocks. So fake blocks or something like that. And I think that uh, uh, issuance doesn't really help against that. Uh, subsidy doesn't help. What really helps is fees. And I think that you cannot trick the, the, the game theory into uh, into pretending there is more fees. The only way you have censorship resistance is with if transactors pay their damned fees. And there is no other way around this. It would be an economic battle between state-sponsored miners censoring and black market fees uh, trying to compensate their censor buying uh, ash rate. This is the Eric Vosquil security model, and I am very much convinced about that. So I think I think that tail submission doesn't change that also because it is going to become irrelevant anyway from an economic point of view what it doesn't do is making it worse in any way so i think that if 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 
I'm against changing the monetary policy in Bitcoin in any way. I think it would be a disaster because if you can change it now, that the sign of centralization that you can change it again later. So it would be death. But I, if Bitcoin was created with telemission, it will not be worse in any way. The only thing that may be better in Monero uh, in this regard is that they, they, I, I like the policy of emission in Bitcoin, which replaces um, subsidy with fees. I think that's necessary for, for censorship resistance in the long run. I don't, I, I don't necessarily like that it's very uh, that halving is, is nice because we can have a party and we can create a bubble. But it's from a security point of view, having a discontinuity that large. And then in 2140, in 2140, last total discontinuity when you have the cutoff to zero, that's, I mean, something smoother may be safer. So if, if, if I went back to 2008 and I knew Satoshi, maybe I will tell him, go like closer to Monero with this. But it's, it's not a strong advantage, advantage either, I think. Yeah, there, I think there's a lot to get into there. Tail emission is an, so an interesting thing. And I think it's important to for everyone to admit that we don't know if tail emission will succeed or a hard cap will succeed still. That's still not something that is, is clear. And I don't think there's been any very, like, this is the truth ways of modeling that out. Um, so I think both are still basically a bet on different trade-offs. Um, but I think for tail emission, I kind of agree with your point about it. Uh, essentially, I mean, when you are asymptotic, asymptotically approaching 0% inflation, eventually you're going to be at realistically the same point that Bitcoin will be one day and that we'll have a low enough emission that it won't be a, it won't be a massive part of the subsidy of the network. The distinction though, is that when you have a block reward, even if the percentage is very low, you have, you prevent a lot of simple greedy mining attacks. Um, and there's a couple really good papers on this where when you have no block reward because the incentive is none to mine when there are not enough transactions or no transactions in the mempool, et cetera, you open up a lot of other potential attacks that wouldn't happen if you have a tail emission because miners aren't going to forgo some income, even if it's just 0.6 Monero and that's 0.00001% of the supply down the road. It's still something and they're not going to forgo that just to wait for transactions. I, I guess... Again, maybe there's some point where it becomes meaningless enough that you're there, but that would at least be very, very far in the future. Uh, but you do prevent a lot of those simpler greedy mining attacks. Um, yeah, but it's certainly not sniping. something where, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you certainly don't pre you don't prevent a nation state attack or something like that. And I I don't think I hope no one's selling that as like tail emission prevents the U.S. from attacking Monero via hash rate. Like that's that's certainly not how that works. And I mean the other aspect of how uh, mining works is if someone has the hash power to attack a network, not only do they get to attack the network, they get the mining subsidy. So if you're giving a tail emission, you actually, in theory, are incentivizing attacks in a different Persist. way yeah. because you are giving them more uh, reward for their attack because they get the block subsidy. So that's exactly. certainly not something that I, I think should be overlooked. And I think it's it's approaching it from, again, a different set of trade-offs. It's not saying tail emission will fix nation state attacks, but it does fix the known issues, the known simple greedy mining attacks, the known problems that come when you hit that zero emission. Point. I mean, it delays for a while that, but eventually, it, it, eventually the cost of, of including the transaction will be, uh, I mean, the cost of doing the block will be higher than the, the, the subsidy anyway. Yeah, but yes. yes, no, that's probably true. But also, I think that the, the, the misconception here, but but then we move on because now we agree and we, we must not agree. Otherwise, this debate is just, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, the, the point of uh, fee sniping is that the assumption, I think, is, is flawed. Uh, if nobody is putting transactions in the in a mempool, well, it means that nobody cares right now for block space security. And so it, it may be that uh, there is fee sniping and the blocks are not advancing. But it's it's irrelevant because if if nobody is is in the mempool, that means that for some reason, second layers we don't know. But for some reason, in this moment, nobody cares for block space security. If nobody cares, the fact that you may have slower block uh, production because of fee sniping, I don't. It, it seems like circular logic to me. But anyway, again, uh, tail emission is not making it worse or better in a relevant way. I think it's very. It's just a more elegant way to go to the same direction. 
I just want to bring you up too, because you guys maybe could both comment on this. It's it's not just tail emission though; it's tail emission plus dynamic block size. That's where, interesting. Where right? arrows blocks get larger, and it takes on more and more transactions per block, uh, adding security in, in that regard. And so. dynamic block size only works when you have a tail emission, because you have to have a block subsidy that you can penalize to right. enable dynamic block size. So that actually is a very good point that it, it enables dynamic block sizes, which in theory can enable greater network security because you can have larger blocks with more fees. Obviously you have the, the inverse of that, which is that now the network is harder to stay decentralized because you have larger blocks, more requirements on nodes. It, I think that's it's a, it's a fine balance that has to be walked there. Um, but the enablement of dynamic block sizes by the tail emission is another aspect you gain from that. That's not just the raw network subsidy. It's it's another aspect that benefits people and, again, is a different set of trade-offs than Bitcoin. Agreed. That, uh, um, dynamic blocks are probably one of the most interesting things on Monero for me. I, it, it was never brought up as a possible. So, I mean, in Bitcoin, when people were talking about changing the block size, now, now it's a taboo argument because we have won the war. But when it was not taboo, uh, that there was a lot of proposal. You just increase it with time. You you just let the miner decide, which is of course is crazy. And like many Rosenfeld has this great idea of uh, uh, elastic blocks where you can basically expand, but then you go back. In Monero, it's interesting because there is a different. Well, basically you put together the block reward with a block size in a very interesting game theory. You cannot do that on Bitcoin because probably you have to touch uh, emission uh, issue schedule. So I, I think, but but it, yeah, it's one of the few things where it's nice that Monero is not a side chain so you can play out with something different. I don't think it will be that relevant at the uh, ultimately, but I admit this uh, that the little Monero MV I may have is also about uh, uh, dynamic blocks, I agree, yeah. All right, I'll I'll take that as a win. I don't know about you, Seth. Uh, <laughs> Seth. Seth, do you want to jump to uh, or continue on talking about auditability? Yeah, yeah, we can just jump to that a little bit again. Um, obviously, this is one of the hot topics, if not the hot topic, that often comes up when when talking about Monero with people. Um, and I think is is another one of those things where you need to individually weigh: is this trade off worth it for you? Um, and obviously, the the benefit that we gain within Monero by having hidden amounts is that our amounts are hidden. So every transaction gains much better privacy. Any approaches that we take to privacy on the base layer can be much stronger because of hidden amounts. Like for instance, ring signatures where you have to do fixed denominations are much less helpful, much less useful and have much smaller anonymity sets than if you're able to do them like you are now where you can include any, any TXO as a decoy and it can be a legitimate decoy because amounts are hidden. And so it doesn't matter if it's a hundred Monero transaction or a 0 0.001 Monero. Um, so hiding those amounts does give immense on-chain privacy and it does enable a lot of the other things. Um, but obviously you do have that trade-off of you lose simple auditability. And I think that is the important distinction is you do not lose auditability. You lose the ability for you to go and do napkin math on the UTXO set and check that amounts validate. If you're just using the um, get TX out set verify or whatever that I can't remember the command off the top of my head, the one that you can use to check the UTXO set and amounts within Bitcoin D, you're still trusting implementation, you're trusting cryptography. It's simpler than when you're doing uh, the same thing in Monero, because obviously in Monero we're using range proofs, but you are still trusting a software implementation, you're trusting similar things, because almost I've, I've actually never heard of anyone actually manually summing up the UTXO set. Um, yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. Not cryptography, though, right? You're, you're trusting software implementation, so bugs can just happen both ways. But you don't have like a, a, like a, a log a, a discrete log assumptions in sure. uh, in yeah. that. So you, you are trusting some math in in yes. case, case of Monero more. So yeah. you have some attack space more. Yeah, that's a good clarification. You're trusting math, not cryptography, in the in the same sense as Monero for sure. Um, but within Monero, you are still you do still have auditability because you're building these range proofs using math. You're creating cryptography that does the amounts in such a way that they're hidden, but they are proven to validate to what they should, and that inputs and outputs balance. But obviously, like you mentioned, you have more assumptions and more trust placed in those things because the cryptography for Monero range proofs is much more complex than the math and code implementation 
for Bitcoin's amounts. Um, so it is something where you're, you're trusting that you open up more of an attack surface for uh, inflation bugs and that potential for hidden inflation is a, a, a big drawback. And that's probably, I think for most people, that is the biggest trade-off that Monero makes and the hardest one to come around to, um, especially if you're coming in from Bitcoin to Monero. Um, I think if you just start with Monero, it, it just makes sense. But when you're coming in from Bitcoin and that that hard assurance of 21 million, that hard assurance of simple auditability, it's a it's a hard one to get over. Um, I think that the trade off is much less impactful if you're focusing on using Monero for transacting and not for the thing that you store all of your wealth in. Um, so I think there's something to consider about if the trade off for you as an individual, not necessarily you, Giacomo, but you as the listener. Um, if you very highly value the auditability, maybe it doesn't make sense for you to keep your, your wealth in Monero and it makes more sense for you to keep your wealth in Bitcoin and then to, to convert monthly or whatever, to have some Monero that you can then spend freely from not convert when you want to spend, cause that is flawed. And I, I talk about that frequently, yeah. um, but converting some Bitcoin to Monero and spending from that, because then your, your risk of holding that Monero, if there was some sort of inflation bug is drastically reduced. Um, I personally think that that risk is incredibly low. I think the cryptographic risk is the actual like cryptographic hardness break is basically not a problem at this point, but software implementation is obviously the biggest potential risk there, um, just as it is and will be for Bitcoin having inflation bugs. But again, because of the cryptography and the hidden amounts, that inflation bug could be more harmful within Monero than Bitcoin. So that is something, again, we need to be honest with people, let people come to their own conclusions with clear visibility, clear understanding of the trade-offs and then figure out what works best for them. Cool. So I, I just wanna, before we move on, sure. and I brought it up in passing. So, but Bitcoins, you know, there is trust. There is trust in cryptography with Bitcoin as well, beyond trust in math, right? Um, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin's elliptic curve, you know, that I think Fluffy Pony, Fluffy Pony made this point in a, in a tweet and you brought it up saying, you know, why, why are we OK with, with trusting Bitcoin's elliptic curve? But then we see issue with, you know, the cryptography that Monero is using for obfuscation. Uh, when we know that there's harsh, you know, that there's real criticism against uh, Bitcoin's elliptic curve from from you know respected cryptographers. So why why are you willing to ignore the security risk with that, but not with the other aspect? And I don't mean to misconstrue the question in any way, but like, what, what's your what's your thinking there? Why isn't that also an important element in your mind? No, it is, but it's just Bitcoin. I mean, you can separate two kinds of security. One is security against theft. Basically, you are spending without being me. Uh, you're basically deriving my private key somehow, uh, and that was not intended. And the other is you are tricking the system into create, printing more money. So these are two different security aspects. In Bitcoin, you don't need any cryptographic assumption for the for the ladder. You do need a cryptographic assumption for the former. So correctness of spending with signatures. And uh, in Monero, you need for both. And uh, and uh, the case where you have a broken cryptography where you can just spend with other people keys is, is the primary uh, security issue in general. So we can assume even the game theory there is that everybody starts to to basically stealing everybody has money. So it's a very diff different game theory. While the game theory of uh, inflation bugs uh, breaking the, uh, the somehow, I, I agree with that, it's, it's very unlikely, but breaking the cryptography inflate uh, in order to inflate, uh, for example, mm, uh, basically breaking the range proofs in order to do some overflow in the confidential, tra in the confidential transaction, uh, that could be, could, that could creep in and be not visible for years before it blows up and you, can, you don't know how to recover. So there are, the, the Monero just has a, an additional tr trust in cryptographic assumption for supply as well. Right, but I mean, if, if you're if you're willing to you know trust Bitcoin's cryptography, why can't you then apply that same logic to trusting Monero's on an additional level? Like the, that, that's that's really the issue at the end of the day is really being able to properly 
audit the software and audit the the math and cryptography underlying it for crypto to work for people to have trust in it that's that's the big issue yeah but the, I, I i don't think you can bitcoin, we've, i'm sure even in the early days of bitcoin you had your your doubts right i'm sure you did uh, when you first discovered and started using Bitcoin, but then over time you became okay with the fact that you, you, you began to trust it as you looked at it more and you trust, you know, as the uh, other experts looked at it and they, you, you gain trust in the code, in the implementation, in the math, in the cryptography. So that is same issue applies to Monero. So I, I, I just don't see why that becomes a critical security issue when we've seen it happen with Bitcoin. It's just different. Like uh, you see, they say signatures are something used elsewhere, something like uh, uh, LibSec is something newer. But when uh, Satoshi was using OpenSSL, uh, it, it was stuff used elsewhere for everything. While uh, the stuff that Monero uses for uh, for uh, specifically for range proof with bulletproof is is newer. Something is not the same level of uh, of trust assumption. I mean the Sign the signature in Monero is somehow even safer, slightly of, on the margin than the right. one used in Bitcoin. But they are both very consolidated. What the the, the new cryptography used for uh, for amount checking, especially for the range proof, is something newer, especially after the adoption of bulletproof, which was great for size and speed, but it's something super new. And, and invented by a Bitcoiner, so maybe it was. It just wanted to to mess with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I I know I beat that one, too, but I want to. I really want to cover that more deeply. I appreciate you. Uh, sure. Discuss it more. Uh, do you want to move? Do you want to move on to uh, the next topic? So, is there or have we covered security? What's the next? The next. the next one, and it's the the last one about the the, the second broader uh, set is uh is uh, the ASIC resistance is another thing that uh, i think is is i i've been i i've both the i've uh, purchased both both the idea that uh, i'm sold with the idea that uh, ASIC resistance is a full serend and that eventually anything which is uh, not arbitrarily changed and if you arbitrarily change it you will have centralization because you will need to enforce, to coordinate our forks and that centralization. And uh, if you don't have that, eventually there will always be ASICs. Even if with RandomX, your ASIC is a CPU formally, but then you can surely optimize in a very different way from a normal CPU. And I think that fighting uh, ASIC ASICification is uh, a fool's errand. And the only the way to go, just like in obfuscation and omission, I think the, the way to go is ASIC friendliness. And I'm very sold on that. I, I, I'm sorry for that because for privacy, ASIC resistance would be great. Not, not for democracy, one, one person, one vote. No, no, that's not the point. The point is that plausible deniability if you run just your computer is high. And if you have a specific uh, specifically printed chip for printing Bitcoin, to smuggle in Venezuela, that's harder. So ASICs are harder to hide, which is bad for privacy of miners, which is bad in general. But I'm sold on the idea that uh, the only way you have in a competitive environment, like a mining game, the only way to have to stay uh, ASIC resistant is basically keep changing it in an arbitrary way. And if you do that, uh, the whole decentralization point is, uh, is basically doomed. So I think oh, yeah, I we think actually a... have Howard Chu on the side. I didn't tell you guys. I'm going to <laughs> loop him in. <laughs> that um, I, I think ASIC resistance is one of the most fascinating differences between Monero and Bitcoin and one that I don't get to talk about enough and I feel like people don't talk about enough. Um, but uh, I think obviously I have some disagreements with what you mentioned and some different points I want to bring up about how it works. But um, I, I think an important distinction is that Bitcoin, basically, the immaculate conception I see with Bitcoin is that it was able to transition from CPUs to GPUs to ASICs in a relatively decentralized way. Um, obviously, there were times when that was it was not very decentralized, but it was reasonably decentralized because it was a new thing. There weren't people out to attack it. Generally, people were, were just being altruistic and working for the best of the network. Um, but that specific CPU to GPU to ASIC approach basically can never happen again. 
because cryptocurrencies are so well known, they exist at a broad scale, there's so much money behind them, so many opportunities from attacks, um, basically no other network can afford to allow ASICs quickly because if a smaller network allows ASICs to be created for the network, they will dominate and they will generally be only produced by one manufacturer. Um, unless you have a very large chain like Bitcoin, where you have the incentives for many manufacturers to start up for people to create uh, new fabs to come up with new things to use the latest um, uh, approaches to building ASICs to constantly be iterating and pouring R&D and pouring money into it, you're going to essentially have a single manufacturer who is the only manufacturer of ASICs on your chain, and then they basically have control over proof of work. They can mine in secret. They can do tons of attacks. They have control over who can mine. It's easy to censor miners. There are a lot of problems that come in with that. And other chains than Bitcoin can't really take the approach that Bitcoin did of allowing ASICs to take over their network. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing things like Ethereum. It's one of the reasons, in my opinion, why they're moving to proof of stake, because it's an easier, easier way for them to do security rather than trying to do ASIC resistance. And why we have generally see we've generally seen ASIC resistance fail is because the approaches have been interesting in theory, but poor in execution and that they allowed very efficient ASICs to be, to be produced. Um, and most of that was because the reliance was on trying to build GPU mined ASIC resistant schemes. Um, whereas GPUs are a much easier thing to parallelize and build ASICs out of. Whereas with random X, it is so far very unique in its approach. We're going on three years now without any clear ASICs on the network. Um, every sign points to the, the best type of ASIC that could be developed being between like two and three times more efficient than a CPU, which is fine and totally within reason and would be not a problem if that kind of an ASIC was released onto the market. Plus it makes it kind of prohibitively expensive from an R and D perspective to build that. Um, but like you mentioned, I mean, the other key advantages for ASIC resistance are really decentralization and, uh, preventing simple censorship of mining hardware, which is a that's a key problem with Bitcoin. And I think as we enter a more adversarial environment with Bitcoin, that will become clear in that home mining will be harder. Countries that are oppressive regimes will crack down on home mining and prevent import export of ASICs. We've already seen that in, in Venezuela, like you mentioned, and, and other places where ASICs are confiscated because it's obvious this ASIC is only being used for mining Bitcoin. It's not your home computer. Yeah. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that go into into play there, but I think thankfully RandomX has been successful in ASIC resistance. But like you mentioned, the path of continual proof of work algorithm changes is not one that's sustainable from a decentralization perspective. And that's why I think the very rough consensus within the Monero community would be if RandomX fails, we'll basically move to uh, an ASIC friendly algorithm because there won't be, it, there's, no, there's no point at that point. Um, but RandomX has been incredibly successful uh, like I said, almost going on three years now since implementation um, without any kind of ASIC on the network, no problems like that. Um, but ASIC resistance is definitely, it's a its a complex topic. It's nuanced. Um, I guess one more thing, sorry, this is quite the monologue, but one more thing is that uh, the thing that I love about an ASIC friendly chain is that you do get very strong security through that sunk cost aspect of it. Because when you buy an ASIC, it can only be used for mining that or maybe some altcoins that use the same algorithm, but generally only used for like mining Bitcoin. Um, and so you get a lot of a lot more sticky miners within the system and you get a lot stronger security through different times. You have less people chain hopping, to trying to find the most uh, valuable thing to mine. You have you have a lot less problems with that. And so that that's sunk cost is a key aspect of, of ASIC friendliness that is is useful and is a very valuable thing. And I think ideally, if we could do ASIC friendly algorithm in a way where we would have multiple manufacturers and everything, it would be at least interesting to entertain. But we would have to then kind of consider is it worth the risk of decentralization worth the risk of mining hardware censorship and, and other things like that. But it's a fun topic and a, a very nuanced and, and tricky one. Well, also in this case, I'm 101% in agree perfect agreement with everything you said. Uh, of course, in light of my main framework of monetary maximalism, uh, what, uh, what I, uh, my interpretation is different because I, I agree with you that no other chain can likely get to uh, a non-messy ASIC friendliness. And I think that's why one of the reasons why 
I don't consider other chains as viable long term. But uh, but I think your presentation of the problem was uh, perfect. But Giacomo, is is your issue that it's it's just futile to to try to make the CPU the ASIC of Monero? Is it, or you see it as it, it risks centralization because. You, you you kind of formulated it as it's it, the pro the issue is because now you know we're gonna have to uh, change our proof of work to maintain our ASIC resistance so that's what you see as being an issue because then there's a centralization there there's a committee coming together to decide what the new proof of work needs to be at different times is that the primary issue you have with it? So the primary issue is that either you succeed and and uh, so as said said the expense the cost for R and D to try to create a random X ASIC are very high. If nobody ever managed to put together the cost, then you're fine. But if you if you fail, then now the entry barrier to, to catch up with this first mover are higher. So uh, the, the problem with ASIC resistance that as long as it's resistant, it's resistant. And then it just become, uh, it's just ASIC expensive and non-ASIC resistant, which make worse the centralization problem because competitors can as to basically reinvest all the r d to compete with the first mover while with asic friendliness everybody builds asics immediately and you have a very uh, very fast competition um, at least in theory uh, so the, the problem is that uh, asic resistance is a bet that if you uh, uh, as long as you win it you're fine but when you lose it all the effort you put it to make it hard will just make it harder for others to compete so uh, the only option you have is to change it. But as said, confirmed, and I completely agree, you cannot keep changing it. That's, that's, that really means that you will have strong centralization at any point in the future, because uh, if you have any kind of capaci capacity of agreement about something that deep as a random, uh, I mean, as a non-deterministic consensus change, that means you have an attack surface, a very strong attack point, a vector more than surface for uh, for other kind of messy stuff so uh, i i i mean if random x succeeds forever but again this is probably another point which depends on the view which for bitcoin is this like a multi-century uh wealth revolution and with monero is a tool that can work good for the next five years so if you change completely the approach and you don't go millenaristic then you can just say, let's hope that RandomX can serve us well for another five years, 10 years, I doubt it. And then we will have to move to ASIC friendliness. But but there's risks with a going the ASIC route, no, too? I mean, there's, there's risk there's there. There's a cost. I don't even think it's a risk. I mean, it's a cost. Of, of centralization, tending towards centralization. Um, yeah. But you don't see that as I mean, uh, you don't and, see and, pri and privacy loss, as we both agree that uh, huge deniability loss. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's people. I think people will hide ASICs inside uh, heating systems, but it's it would be easier to hide them inside a computer. How about centralization issues? So, like, we're all you know, all the mining essentially run by you know a few large companies that you know are able to take advantage of. As said, say, as said, said uh, I don't think that uh, an a, a ASIC friendliness on Monero will create a very strong centralization at this point because you cannot have you cannot have this moment of ignorance that was around Bitcoin when it was. Uh, th that's what the immaculate conception is, seems like a ridiculous meme, but it, it's it's a it's a funny way to say something very serious. You cannot repeat the situation of non-adversarial the non-adversarial scenario that you have with Bitcoin. Because nobody cared and nobody knew, and now even when Green launched with Mimble Wimble, and there was the fair, uh, the fair proof of work launch, and there were like uh, the capital VC uh, doing like Ponzi schemes on Green mining uh, three months before the launch, because because everybody's expecting stuff, both from the OPSEC compromisation point of view and from the financial incentives point of view. You cannot. In 2008, you could launch Bitcoin uh, just with hackers and uh, and cryptographers and idealists and cypherpunks. Now you can't. 90% of the attention you will get will be spooks or grifters. And, and there's nothing you can do about that. Seth, any uh, closing comments on this topic? 
Yeah, I think just the closing one. I think there is, and this is something that I've never even talked about in the Monero community, but there, there is the approach that could be taken of RandomX works. It's working now. It has been working for almost three years now. You could do something where you plan for ASIC friendliness far out in the future to give manufacturers time to, to build up the decentralization of ASIC manufacturers to get ASICs in people's hands beforehand and do something like two, three, four, five years out. We're going to switch to SHA-3 at this point. And you could do that because of the ASIC resistance of RandomX and because of its success and say, if we were worried about RandomX working forever, you could do that approach of trying to give a decentralized approach to ASIC friendliness a go by using that ASIC resistance as a, a delay mechanism um, and baking that out further in the future. There is a lot that goes in there. I don't know if that would work either. That's um, interesting. But since could, RandomX you, works now, that is an approach that you could take. Yeah, you could do not, you could do it not just even uh, time schedule, but even difficulty schedule. Like when difficulty mm -hmm. approaches something, you you yeah, that's that's an interesting proposal. You yeah, could. you could slowly activate ASICs as a certain percentage of the network. There's a, there's a lot of stuff you could do. And there was some, the Grin situation was nuts, but their interesting approach was that they started. Uh, I think it was GPU mined, but they essentially slowly shifted the proof of work algorithm over to an ASIC friendly one yeah. in a way that incentivized a slow transition to ASIC friendliness. Um, but so not slow, like that could also be done. But not slow, not slow enough for not yeah. having a huge speculation around it, which was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot Grin existed until you mentioned it. So it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. You want, you want to move on to. A I, I think there's one one last issue you wanted to bring up or no the the point two is over i can just move with three which is the three marketing narratives that i hate about the current state of monero i can i cannot even discuss monero anymore and i just block people so <laughs> so the the first one is set already mentioned it uh of course uh it's i i think we agree it's problematic to keep uh, monero as your long-term store of value so maybe you're using, or maybe many people are using Bitcoin for that. I think it's uh, uh, what you need to do is to buy some Monero. At least if you if you have concerns of this type, uh, like I would, you buy some Monero, which is an um, um, undefined amount, and then you consume this spending and receiving, and then you just repeat on your move to Bitcoin when you want to uh, to to store long term. But the problem with this approach is that everywhere this is this is discussed in a, in a in a fast way what people are understanding and i have countless examples on my comments everywhere is that you can use monero on the fly as some kind of privacy cosmetics on bitcoin i know since our last twitter interaction that sets agree that this doesn't work but i i think that even mccormack after talking with you I'm not even sure it did understand this difference. I think that many, because like the, the wallet it was proposing then it was like, I'm keeping Bitcoin. When I need to do a very nasty purchase, I will just, uh, I will just walk. And of course, if everybody, if a, la if a large sum of the, uh, of the economy does like that, and I think many people are doing like that because now there is the meme that you just use Monero transactionally and you keep Bitcoin as store of value. The problem is that you have a trivial amount correlation across the seller and the receiver, and you basically reduce your privacy instead of increasing it. Because if you just sent a, a, a pay join, you had, you'd have a better privacy than, than uh, swapping on a public uh, uh, order book for Monero and having your merchant doing basically the same thing a few seconds later or a few minutes later <clears throat> or anyway with strong amount correlation and time correlation so the the thing that i i know set agrees but i don't think these messages is coming across that you have to batch a lot of private payment in order to make this double money system work anyhow which in a way uh, curiously enough is similar to one one of the meme we had with with litecoin that was people were like okay i i i don't want to pay high fees in bitcoin so now we just use lightning and and then they were like okay i use bitcoin i sell it i need to pay fees to sell it i get lightning uh, sorry i get litecoin i i spend litecoin and now my merchant will do the opposite you're spending more fees that that that, that with bitcoin so if you do that on the fly it doesn't work you have to use monero at least as 
a partial store of value for some amount. Otherwise, it cannot work as a privacy enhancement. It's just damaging for the privacy. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of the main Monero reply guy narratives that I've been pushing back on because I think that is a potentially harmful one. And in, I think when you think about it in terms outside of cryptocurrency, it, you also kind of grasp how ridiculous that concept is too because like that's like telling people, keep your money in your bank account, but then every time you need to spend, go to the ATM, get cash out, and then spend just the amount that you want to do. But then the bank knows you were in this physical location. You withdrew this much from the ATM. So you probably spent $20 there because you only withdrew $20. Then you do that again the next time. And there are a lot of problems where you open up other operational security concerns when you're doing that. And especially because, like you mentioned, normally the, the middleman there is not an atomic swap that's over Tor. It's it's some sort of instant exchanger like change now or side shift or fixed float or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so they gain an immense amount of information about people and they can, like you said as well, if the merchant immediately converts back to Bitcoin, which I don't think that that happens. I haven't talked to any merchants that when they receive Monero, they convert immediately back to Bitcoin. But if they were to do that, that would make the situ situation even worse because then it would be relatively trivial for that exchange to figure out you spent from Bitcoin to Monero. And then we got back the same Monero TXO in the next one, which we can guess is probably the same transaction and then they went to bitcoin and they went here oh but that's also the wallet of binance or whatever or coin cards or whatever you want to say um so there are a lot of problems there i think it's also kind of a painful way to try to use monero as a transactional tool for privacy um but what i try to explain to people and i think the the correct approach to this idea and i think one that is is useful for people who don't want to store value in Monero long term. Um, and I think that is definitely personal choice. I don't think that storing value in Monero long term is a, a bad thing and people need to come to their own conclusions. But for those people who explicitly do not want to store value in Monero long term, you need to treat it just like you would a checking account or something like that, where you don't move, oh, I'm at the coffee shop, I'm about to spend $8 on a coffee inflation. Um, you don't just move $8 from your savings account to your checking account and then swipe your debit card. You don't do that. What you do is every month you move, okay, my budget is $1,500 this month. You move $1,500 from your checking, from your savings into your checking, and then you spend from your checking and you top it up as necessary or you top it up the next month or whatever. Um, and I think that approach of you estimate how much am I going to spend this month using cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or Monero, and then you, tran you transfer from Bitcoin to Monero of that amount that'll cover the month or six months or a year, whatever you're comfortable withholding in Monero. Um, and then just spending from that, receiving to that. If you're doing other things where you earn Monero or receive Monero, you may not even have to top that up. But that, I think, is the, the reasonable approach. And I think one that is useful from both a privacy perspective and a self-sovereignty perspective and, and is a good fit. But yes, I think that this this false narrative that you should just instant exchange into Monero and then send directly to the merchant. It's an okay stopgap if you just have to do that for some reason. And I don't think everyone has to be paranoid about it, but it is not the best long-term approach and it's not the best approach for privacy. And it is not a, a panacea or a perfect world where you just suddenly have magic privacy when you're using an instant exchanger that knows your IP address usually. And there's a lot that goes into that. But yes, I think that, that that narrative of just swapping into Monero at transaction time and using the instant exchanger as you're going to send the Monero for me is a problematic one and, and not one that should be pushed and not one that people should be told. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad we agree about that. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm always pushing the more extreme, which is just stay, <laughs> stay in Monero. I mean, stay in Monero. Okay. Yeah. I would disagree with that, of course. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.